Hi uh, guys, as some of you know, I was talking about social media on uh, BBC's Business Matters radio show. Uh, this is the full episode. I start probably about 25 minutes in, but I encourage you to check out the whole thing. Very interesting. Uh, and check out iPlayer as well. I'll put a link below. But you can listen to all the latest episodes and download them for free as podcasts as well. Um, enjoy. Midnight GMT. Hello, I'm Susanna Streestrom. This is Business Matters on the BBC World Service. In America, the working day is winding down, but in Asia, it's the start of another day. We're connecting the time zones and we're live in Hong Kong and Sydney. Talks aimed at solving the deadlock over the US debt crisis end with tremendous progress, but still no deal. With the country another day closer to not paying its bills, who could be first in line to lose out? All these people are down here because things are broken. It's broken all the way around. I mean, isn't it? I'm tired of getting kicked around. I I've lost money on this. Plus, tempting the Chinese tourists, Britain says it'll streamline its visa system. And they've been ringing doorbells with their wares for over half a century. But is it au revoir to Avon ladies in France? That's all after the latest BBC News. BBC News with Neil Nunes. A meeting between President Obama and congressional leaders to discuss the U.S. debt crisis and the partial government shutdown has been postponed to allow Democrat and Republican senators more time to negotiate. It's understood they are discussing a proposal to extend borrowing into next year. Mr. Obama said despite the slowness of talks, he was optimistic about eventually reaching an agreement. There's been some progress on the Senate side with Republicans recognizing it's not tenable, it's not smart, it's not good for the American people to let uh, America default. There's been some progress in recognizing that we're not going to be able to completely bridge the differences between the parties all at once, and so it doesn't make sense in the meantime to try to use a shutdown or the threat of default as leverage in negotiations. So that's progress. Officials in the U.S. say an al-Qaeda suspect who was arrested in Libya is now in New York awaiting trial for terrorism offenses. Abu Anas al-Libi is suspected of planning attacks on U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania in 1998. Ben Lowings reports. The 49-year-old known as Abu Anas al-Libi was captured by U.S. special forces in a raid in Tripoli earlier this month. Military interrogators questioned him on board the USS San Antonio before Mr Libby was handed over to civilian custody at the weekend. He's likely to be presented in front of a judicial officer in New York on Tuesday. He was indicted in New York in 2000 and since then he's been on the FBI's most wanted list with a $5 million reward for his capture. Libyan militia groups saw the commando raid in Tripoli as a breach of Libyan sovereignty – but the Americans said Mr Libby was a legal and an appropriate target. The Brazilian government says it's moving all of its official communications to new software that's been developed by the country's own information technology agency. The communications minister said the move was necessary to prevent digital spying. Its introduction follows allegations that the American National Security Agency intercepted government emails and calls, as Eric Camara now reports. These are the first measures President Juma Rousseff has taken since the allegations that the American National Security Agency intercepted government emails and calls, including her own. The Brazilian leader has repeatedly criticized the United States for its intrusion, and now she's fighting back. The Expresso v 3 servers will be exclusively based in Brazil, and its encryption is intended to guard against foreign surveillance. But experts question the ability of Brazil to protect its government emails from the eyes of the U.S. National Security Agency. World News from the BBC. The Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif has said disagreements over his country's nuclear program can be resolved within one year. Speaking on the eve of a resumption of negotiations, Mr. Zarif told reporters that Iran was ready to address international concerns over its program. There have been signs of a rapprochement between Iran and its chief adversary, the United States, since the election of President Hassan Rouhani in June. 
After eight hours of coalition talks in Berlin, Germany's Conservatives and Social Democrats have agreed to meet again later this week for a third round of negotiations about forming a new government. The German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who narrowly failed to win a parliamentary majority in last month's election, is expected to announce a coalition partner within days. The authorities in Mexico are searching for an airplane that is missing with at least 14 people on board. Officials fear the plane could have been caught in bad weather caused by Tropical Storm Octave, which is approaching the Mexican coast. Seven states, including Baja California Sur, where the plane disappeared, have declared a state of alert ahead of the storm. A study of bonobo chimpanzees in the Democratic Republic of Congo suggests that apes comfort each other like humans. More in this report from Victoria Gill. The sound of ape consolation. This young bonobo was bitten by an adult, but its screams are quietened almost instantly when another youngster rushes over to wrap the victim in a tight hug. Bonobos live in close social groups. They groom, embrace and even use sex to resolve disputes. This research suggests that, like humans, bonobos have to learn to manage their own emotions before they can empathise with others. Young apes that recovered quickly from the emotional upheaval of an attack were far more likely to approach other youngsters in distress. That's latest BBC World News. Hello and welcome to Business Matters. I'm Susanna Streeter. On the programme today, a day closer to default, but there is talk of tremendous progress on Capitol Hill during talks to end the debt deadlock. Also, Britain makes it easier for visitors from China to get visas to the UK. Just who benefits? Plus, what it's like to win the Nobel Prize for Economics announced today. Well, I'd just gotten out of the shower. (laughs) <laughs> I was getting up for a trip this morning that I now cancelled. I feel very honoured to be singled out. And I'll be joined throughout the programme by two guests on opposite sides of the world. Guy Steer from Société Générale, who's in Hong Kong, and social media specialist Dane Cobain here in London. But first, tremendous progress, but not there yet. That's the verdict on talks aimed at ending the deadlock over the US budget crisis from Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid. He and his Republican counterpart, Mitch McConnell, have been trying to reach an agreement before the deadline on Thursday. That's when the US will hit its debt ceiling. In other words, the limit on how much it's allowed to borrow. Republicans and Democrats need to agree to raise that ceiling because if they don't, well, the world's biggest economy will be unable to pay its bills in the coming weeks. After addressing the Senate, Mr Reid called for patience. We'll have no more votes tonight. And uh, we hope, with uh, good fortune and the support of all of you, recognising how hard this is for everybody, that uh, perhaps tomorrow will be a bright day. We're not there yet. We hope it will be. Earlier, angry protesters gathered outside the White House demanding an end to the shutdown. All these people are down here because things are broken. It's broken all the way around. I mean, isn't it? I mean, I'm tired of getting kicked around. I've lost money on this. You know what? It's Republicans and Democrats. It's not just a one-party deal. Okay? It's, it's, It's the establishment. It's the... It's the elected officials are no longer representing the people. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican. You have to look at this as an American and see that they aren't looking out for you. So with no immediate deal in sight on either the shutdown or the debt ceiling, just who is most likely to see their government checks and payments bounce first? Daniel Lacal is the senior portfolio manager at asset management firm Ecofin, who managed some $3 billion worth of assets. We've seen this before, and I remember the government shut down 95, 96, which went all through uh, Christmas as well. So there was a lot of news at the time, and it was pretty much the same. You know, President Clinton said he was not going to be held ransom, where he didn't use the same words. But it was a pretty similar environment. I think that the difficulty this time is that you're putting together three things. You have the government shutdown on one side, you have Obamacare added to the whole debate, and then you have 
have the debt ceiling. So that makes it complicated, but not impossible. And I think that we will see an agreement, but the agreement has to come for, with a compromise from both sides. It has to be a compromise on spending, because if not, we will have the same debate in a few months' time with another debt ceiling problem. And it has to be a compromise also on the Obamacare program, which should not be part of the discussions. But if there isn't this compromise before the 17th of October, what will happen then? Will people just suddenly not receive benefit checks, for example? No, not really. I think that on the 17th of October, basically the Treasury has about 30 billion of cash available. There is no real issue until more or less mid-month when there's about 60-odd billion of payments to pensions, Medicare, etc., And that would create a potential problem for the debt repayments of the end of the month, which is about 30 billion. So there is enough cash to last until the end of the month. And I think that by then it would be very logical to see an agreement between both both parties. Uh, the U.S. defaulted once in 1979. Uh, it was a technical default, a delay it was called at the time. So we have seen this before and it has an impact. It has an impact because bond yields rise. The perception of ris- risk increases significantly in the markets. But uh, I don't think we'll get to that point. I think that uh, it was recently said that the option of the of, of the U.S. defaulting is not an option, and I don't think anyone is, is 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 looking at that. Many people, though, said that we wouldn't even get to this point so close to the October the seventeenth date. If that money, that thirty billion, runs out at the end of the month, do we know which sections of the population in the U.S. will be hit first? Yeah, we don't know because first, there's no possibility for the Treasury to decide. There's no prioritization; doesn't exist. It's automatic. Basically, out of that 30-odd billion of, of available cash, it will be a first-come, first-served situation. So you probably will find out if you're one of the last ones that you will not receive your check in time. Uh, it will not be a problem. You're and, pretty uh, convinced those checks will keep coming through the post. At the end of the day, there is something that's very, very clear, is that you create a monumental effect on the bond markets and on the equity markets, and both parties do care about that quite a lot. So I think that we will see some agreement. Daniel Agel from ECOFIN there. Now, the UN's World Tourism Organization reckons that China has become the world's most valuable source of tourists, with expenditure on travel abroad reaching $102 billion last year. No surprise then that governments around the world are doing their utmost to try and cash in on the travelling renminbi and look at how it can boost their own economies. Britain has just revealed it will make it easier for China citizens to get visas to travel to the UK. The announcement came as George Osborne, the UK's Chancellor of the Exchequer or Finance Minister, is in China leading a British trade delegation. Tom Jenkins is the chief executive of the European Tour Operators Association and he said a relaxation of the visa rules would really benefit UK companies. This is fundamentally welcome news, I suppose chiefly in terms of its symbolic nature. Um, It's the first time the UK has recognised that there is a problem with visas in China and they're willing to do a market-specific exercise to try and encourage people to come here by relaxing the visa system. So, I mean, it may not be surprising, but it's basically good news. Because we're seeing every year record numbers of Chinese visitors in the UK, but compared to elsewhere in Europe, it's a very different picture, isn't it? France, you get ten times the amount of Chinese visitors. Well, indeed. I mean, France issues more visas than the UK does, probably about 25% more, but it welcomes roughly eight times as many people coming in across the borders because these people have Schengen visas. And if you can get a Schengen visa to come to Europe, you can visit 25 countries without applying for another visa. The UK, it takes another visa, and that's another process. And as a result, UK companies are losing out on potential on a potential gold mine, really. I think you're right. I mean, there's no doubt that the Chinese are shopping at the moment and the place that they're shopping is in in Lucerne, in in Paris and in Milan. Uh, Then They are shopping a bit in London. Uh, They're very important to some London stores, but it's nothing like the volumes you're seeing in Europe. Would you say that the UK is a little bit late to the party with regard to making this trip 
to China to really promote the UK, not just as a place to visit, but as a place to do business as well. This is not a sort of instant game dealing with China. China is going to be a long, slow process. So um, given it's a long game, being slightly late into the market isn't disastrous. The important thing is to realise the weakness of our position. And at the moment, from tourism terms, because we require another visa, we are in a very weak position. As far as Europe's concerned, what are the main competitors elsewhere in the world uh, for drawing uh, the high-spending Chinese tourists? The the biggest uh, destination for Chinese, and it's logged as an outbound tourist, is is Hong Kong and Macau. This eats uh, the overwhelming majority of outbound Chinese. Uh, This is hotly followed by the rest of Asia, and uh, coming up fast is the United States and North America. But I think you'll find that Europe... Uh, is in a strong position. It's got a unique cultural offering to offer the Chinese. Uh, The Chinese see it as a a centre of excellence, of luxury goods, particularly luxury brands, and of tremendous soft power. And the UK is still in a very strong position. The Chinese are learning English more than any other language. And I think the UK should be in a strong position in the medium to long term. But it has to rectify uh, the problems it's got concerning its border controls. Tom Jenkins, Chief Executive of the European Tour Operators Association. Now, economics is known as the dismal science, but occasionally, just occasionally, there's something to celebrate. Today, that was the Nobel Prize for Economics, which was awarded jointly to three Americans. They got it for developing ways to study trends in stock, bond and house prices, work that's changed the way people invest. The winners are two University of Chicago economists, Eugene Farmer and Lars Peter Hansen, and Yale University professor Robert Schiller. Well, we caught up with Professor Schiller not long after he heard about his win of the Nobel Economics Prize. My colleague Manuela Saragossa asked him where he was when he'd heard the news. Well, I'd just gotten out of the shower. <laughs> I was getting up for a trip this morning that I now cancelled. Did you have any inkling that you might win? Well, various of my friends were telling me they thought I might, but I thought it was a low prob- very low probability. What made you think that it would be a low probability? Well, I, my perspective of the world is there's a lot of remarkable people doing very interesting things, <laughs> and they all have friends telling them that they're going to win a prize. So that's why I feel very honored to be singled out. A lot of people will think your study on asset prices predicted the financial crisis. Have you applied your theories to what's happening at the moment? We have something like 190 countries in the world, and they're all doing different things. Right now, I'm struck at how stock markets of many countries of the world have gone through big changes. Some of them are almost in bubbles. Others are still very depressed. The housing markets of the world, many countries are showing bubbly behavior. And they're scattered all over the world. Other countries are still in deep depression. It's very puzzling to try to understand these things. I've been trying to, in my research, trying to take a more eclectic approach that brings in both financial theory, mathematical finance, but also the other social sciences, such as psychology and sociology. Unfortunately, it involves so many different research directions. One thing that I'm proud of is that I have worked with Richard Thaler to organize, over the last 20 years, a series of conferences on behavioral finance. So I've been trying to help coordinate the activities of many people who are broadening the scope of research into understanding financial prices. And that was Professor Robert Schiller, joint winner of the Nobel Economics Prize. You're with Business Matters from the BBC World Service. Let's get a reminder now of the top headlines this hour with Neil Nunes. A meeting between President Obama and congressional leaders to discuss the US debt crisis and the partial government shutdown has been postponed to allow Democrat and Republican senators more time to negotiate. It's understood they are discussing a proposal to extend borrowing into next year. It also includes a framework for further negotiations on reducing the government deficit. The United States says a Libyan militant leader who was seized earlier this month in Tripoli by American special forces has been transferred to New York. 
Officials said Abu Anas al-Libi had been questioned on board a Navy ship while traveling to the U.S. and would face criminal charges. He's wanted in connection with the bombing of the American embassies in Tanzania and Kenya in 1998. And there's been an explosion at one of the most prestigious hotels in Burma's main city, Rangoon. One American guest was injured in the blast at the Traders Hotel, which caused little damage. It's the latest in a series of small explosions in Burma, also known as Myanmar. Thanks, Neil. You're listening to Business Matters on the BBC World Service. Coming up, more business stories from around the globe, including why the end of the bailout of Ireland doesn't spell the end of austerity for the Irish. We went through the 80s. I thought it was bad then. Now it's definitely worse. It's hitting everybody. Nobody is safe from it. Our regular commentator Lucy Kellaway argues you should never work for free. They blog and tweet for nothing. They talk on panels, go on conferences, give advice and even write books. All for nothing. But why? And will the Avon Madame soon stop ringing doorbells? Is the cosmetics giant pulling out of France? We find out. Well, let's return to one of our top stories now and news that the UK is to streamline the visa process for Chinese visitors as part of a drive to increase business between the two countries. It comes as numbers from the UN's World Tourism Organisation show that China has become the world's most valuable source of tourists with expenditure and travel abroad, reaching $102 billion last year. So it's no wonder that the UK wants to get a slice of the pie when it comes to revenue from inbound tourism. So let's talk to my guests on the programme today, Dane Cobain, who's social media specialist, who's with me here in the studio. Hello there, Dane. Hi, are you all right? Very well. And how's Guy Steer, who's head of Asia-Pacific Research at Société Générale in Hong Kong? I'm great, thank you. Good. So, Guy, let me speak to you first of all. Have you witnessed a change in attitudes towards travel among the Chinese? Well, definitely. I mean, I think over the past uh, 10 years, first of all, Chinese people have uh, traveled a lot more within China itself. Uh, and they've also been a lot more eager to travel outside of China. And that really uh, is reflected in the numbers and the, the really exponential growth you've seen in the amount of Chinese tourists outside of China itself. There are a lot of Chinese uh, tourists here in Hong Kong and Chinese tourists spending a lot of money, too. But it's much more difficult for them to travel to the UK. They have to fill in reams more information, um, all in English, uh, just to get one visa to go to the UK, whereas they can go to 25 countries with just one visa under the Schengen uh, visa scheme. No surprise, then, that they're not opting to go to the UK. Well, I think that's right. I mean, I think also that depending on which sort of Chinese tourist you have, uh, the the things that Chinese tourists associate Europe with or the, the bits of Europe that Chinese tourists think about um, may be a bit different. Here in Hong Kong, of course, uh, people are very used to the UK and have um, have uh, close historic ties with the UK. And so some people are very interested in going to the UK. I think that for a lot of Chinese tourists, when they think of Europe, they think of uh, luxury goods brands. Uh, And that traditionally means uh, France or Italy. So a lot of them may be tempted to go shopping, uh, particularly in Paris or Milan. Okay, and Dane Cobain in the studio, you advise companies on their social media strategies. There'll be lots of tourism companies, hoteliers and uh, hospitality, um, the hospitality industry here in the UK wanting to tempt more Chinese visitors. Um, There already are lots, but they really want to get more coming. How would you advise them to do that? Well, I suppose the first thing to do is to actually break up the, the target audiences. So obviously you've got your, your, um, your leisure travellers who are based in China. You've got your business travellers. Both of them will use, um, you know, d- they will use the Internet essentially in different ways. And this is how, how we are most likely to bring people in. Um, top Chinese social networks are completely different to the top UK ones as well. So there are um, the three big ones. There's QZone and then there is uh, Tencent Weibo and Sina Weibo. Um, I apologise for my pronunciation there as well. <laughs> Um, but there's also the actual, um, you know, the, the, the Chinese people who are living in the UK who have, who have you know, extended family back in China who the, they'll, they'll be using UK-based social networks as well. Uh, obviously, one, one of the big problems with Chinese people being able to access things like Twitter and Facebook is that quite often, that, that you, you know, they can't actually get access to it because of uh, the Great Firewall of China, as it's called. So, 
Um, if you can empower your, you know, your UK um, based ch um, Chinese citizens, then they'll be able to spread the message back to their family. And, um, you know, you're much more likely to trust a recommendation from a family member or a friend than you are from a company themselves as well. Excellent. OK, Dan Cobain, many thanks. Much more advice um, from you about using social media coming up. Guys, dear, do stay with me as well in Hong Kong. I just want to tell you about another story. Ireland's ending its emergency lending from the International Monetary Fund in the European Union in December this year, the first Eurozone country to do so. To supporters of cutbacks in spending, Ireland's exit would be held up of an example of how austerity works, but the country's financial troubles are far from over. The Prime Minister has admitted that the government's spending and income plans due to be unveiled will include another €2.5 billion Euros in tax rises and spending cuts. Our reporter, Diamond Fleming, has been speaking to an austerity-weary population. I'm in RD, a small, busy market town about 65 kilometres north of Dublin. The town would be typical of many in Ireland today, with the scars of economic recession and the fingerprints of austerity easily seen. A shop across the road is boarded up, closed down in the last five years since recession came. The town is named from the Irish language after a hero of Irish legend called Ferdia who died in battle here. But many in this picturesque little market town have another battle on their hands today to find work. There were vast numbers of people um, employed in construction. Boys, young men coming out of school, going straight into well-paid jobs. We all thought the bubble wouldn't burst, but it did. Fanola Malone runs the RD Job Club, a state-funded enterprise to get people back to work. No easy task in a country with one of the highest rates of unemployment in the European Union, at over 13%, a figure masked by a return to widespread emigration from Ireland. We went through the 80s. I thought it was bad then. Now it's definitely worse. Even elderly people are being hit. Old age pensioners who have nothing bar the roof over their head are being asked to pay €400 Euro in property tax out of a pension. It's hitting everybody. Nobody is safe from it. Ella, which shoes do you want? Do you want those ones? Trying out new shoes. A painful process just as economic hardship is proving in Ireland, say customers here. It's terrible. People have nothing now. They're taking everything off us now. There's nothing now at all. There's my daughter trying to get school books down. She's struggling to pay a mortgage. She's walking. Her husband is walking. Pay a mortgage. It's terrible hard. It's really terrible hard. The people feel that the austerity has gone too far. There's literally nothing left at the end in the pot. There are a lot of people who, who would be in a lot of trouble with more levies and water charges and the property tax. You know, there's very little left for people to spend money locally in the economy and therefore the economy's staying stagnant, you know. Carney's General Store is RD's oldest business and just celebrated 125 years trading. But owner Seamus Carney says this year has been the toughest he's seen in a lifetime behind the counter. Well, I'm 47 years here. The worst day, I think we had in those 47 years happened this year. There was the least takings of any day and I would have had records probably for 25 years prior to my being here. People with money never really spent money. It was the day-to-day -day working class people that kept us in business over the years. Don't expect the working class person to take all the brunt. They can't, they won't and they shouldn't. A song which was once an anthem in the 1980s when Ireland lost a generation who went abroad. The return today of mass emigration has been painful for parents like Linda Martin, whose son and daughter are in Australia. I have a new grandchild who was born over there and my heart's broke that they're over there. You know, that I haven't got time to spend with them and I'm just heartbroken that they're gone. I literally cry every night because I'd love to pop around to see my children, but they're not here. They're so far away. I think a lot of families are like that in the country. Let me confirm to you that Ireland is on track to exit the EU IMF bailout on December 15th, 2013. Ireland's leader, Enda Kenny, has won praise from abroad, 
for the austerity his government's imposed in return for the 85 billion euro bailout after the country's banks crashed. Ireland may leave the bailout in two months, but the social cost of painful austerity may take a lot longer to estimate. Dermot Fleming reporting. You're listening to Business Matters with me, Susanna Streeter. Do stay with us, lots more to come. Hello and welcome back to Business Matters with me, Susanna Streeter. Harnessing social media is recognised as a powerful tool for businesses in winning customers and building brands. Today, the vast majority of firms use the likes of Twitter and Facebook, but it can be to varying levels of success. There are plenty of examples of major blunders by companies who may have left managing social media platforms to very junior staff who, or who simply can't keep up with complaints which go viral. So just what are the pitfalls businesses should avoid when tweeting, poking, or Instagramming about their products or services. Well, my guest on the programme today, Dane Cobain, is a social media specialist who works with companies to help build their profiles. Hello there, Dane. Hi, are you okay? Very well, thank you. So first of all, tell me how you became a social media specialist. What do you do? Well, those, I suppose, are two different questions, but um, I studied creative writing at university. Um, I've always been passionate about writing. I actually used social media uh, to begin with to promote my own writing. Um, And then I suppose that translated then into kind of quite a junior position, a um, a PR agency doing social media. Um, I kind of grew into the role from there. And then I've moved on to uh, a a marketing agency where actually social is just this 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 one cog kind of in an an overall machine, I suppose. And when you say doing social media for people listening who who aren't on Twitter or Facebook and haven't really got to grips with it, what do you do? How do you help companies? manage their profiles well i suppose i mean one of the things to consider is that social media itself has actually been around for you know thousands and thousands of years really it's the way we communicate with each other it's just uh social networking sites allow you to take that conversation online but it allows you to reach a much greater audience as well um in in general it, it involves working very closely with companies who you know they have something to say but they might not necessarily know how to say it um where to say it um what what good looks like um how to measure their success, for example. So we help them to, um, to to sort of pull that all together into an actual strategy as well. So. And do you think some of the pitfalls that I was talking about earlier spring from the fact that lots of companies have kind of rushed to get on board the on board this this bandwagon, really? yet haven't really thought thought through how they're going to manage it, how they're going to be updating their feeds every single day with new information, but not doing too much to start annoying their customers. Yeah, I mean, I think potentially, I I think it's more common with smaller companies for them to decide to jump straight into social media with no plan. They might, you know, assign it to an intern. They might assign it to a junior member of staff who's already overstretched as it is and who has no training. Larger companies tend to be the other way around, so they, they take quite a long time to react to things and and you know they can actually react too slowly as well um but quite often when people make mistakes there are kind of maybe three or four main mistakes that people make the most common one seems to be people forgetting to log out of their company account and into their personal account that happens a surprising amount um and quite often people try to jump on say uh, you know something that's trending on twitter for example without actually checking why it's trending so so tell me of an example of that that's gone wrong. So there are a few fairly famous ones. Uh, probably one of the, the most famous ones is uh, a company called Celeb Boutique. They jumped on to the fact that uh, hashtag Aurora was trending. So they t- tweeted saying, uh, Aurora is trending clearly about our new Kim Kardashian-inspired dress. And the reason that Aurora was trending was because of the uh, the shooting at the premiere of The Dark Knight Rises. And so obviously instantly people started to reply that. They retweeted it. And one of the problems with social media is as soon as something's being retweeted it's kind of hard to get rid of it so even if they delete that original tweet there'll be screenshots of it floating around and you know it's, it's almost impossible to, to get rid of it as soon as one person spots it and you talk about junior staff uh, being put in charge of twitter feeds there was a case at hmv a, a music store chain in the uk where a, a junior member of staff was put in in charge i believe she in fact was an intern put in charge of the Twitter feed, and when lots of staff were sacked, uh, she made her views particularly clear. Why do you think companies do that and don't put a a manager in position? Do they just not recognise the value of social media? 
Um, I mean, again, it's an interesting one. I mean, smaller companies don't really have the resources to do that, but then smaller companies quite often, you know, outsource to an agency. Um, a larger company like HMV really should have known better, to be honest. I mean, they to be to their credit, they did react very quickly. They managed to reclaim the account um, back from back from the person that was tweeting. She was actually live tweeting as people were were being fired, which was was quite interesting. Um, but I, I think people quite often fail to to put in in fail safes like a, a written social media protocol uh, they fail to consider all of their logins there's um, something that recently happened uh, well probably about six months ago Twitter um, reset passwords for a, um, a huge number of accounts they did more than they meant to um, there was a, a security leak and um, the, the, you had to um, send an email to the, the email address that you registered the account with. Now, obviously, the problem is, is not everybody knows what email address they registered the account with. And it, it wouldn't tell you because it was, a, you know, a security feature. So it's really important to keep all of this information together, essentially. And people just don't do it. Well, Guy Steer is listening in Hong Kong from Society General. And we were talking earlier um, about the fact that there are lots of different social media platforms. And those in, say, China are very different to those that are popular um, in the UK or the US or elsewhere around the world. That's quite difficult for companies trying to get a foothold in, say, China, isn't it, Guy? Well, I think that's right. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly uh, no social media specialist, unlike Dane, but I do sense that the um, that the media which are most uh, used in the West are not necessarily used in China. So probably you need to, and, and Dane would have interesting views on this, you need to have probably a multi-strategy in terms of, or a different strategy for each country you think about going into. That's a real juggling act, though, Dane, isn't it? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, again, one thing, it needs to all be integrated as well, though. So even if you are using different social networks, um, uh, for, you know, to reach Chinese users because they, they might not be able to access the, the ones you would normally use, you, you can't really have, uh, uh, you can't have the two working as separate silos. You need to have the communication between the two of them. Um, you know, you need to find out what co even common complaints about your product are for a start. I mean, that's one thing that pe people don't tend to even you know listen to this feedback from social there's a this really bad attitude of you know um, a, a complaint is a problem to be dealt with rather than an opportunity to actually improve your product or your service as well now we talked a lot about um, how companies use social media but there has also been a uh, research that came out a couple of weeks ago about about personal use of uh, social media platforms and how it doesn't often make you feel particularly happy when you've been perusing uh, the events and personal lives of all your acquaintances and they all seem uh, so much much better than your own. What advice do you give somebody who's feeling a little bit down about their own personal uh, social media presence? Um, I would say log off and go and do something worth <laughs> worth posting about, to be honest. But um, I, I suppose it's a tricky one, isn't it? Uh, it, it it's, it's mainly Facebook that's actually going to cause this issue as, re as well, really, because obviously on, on Twitter you're, you're following uh, celebrities for a large part as well. So, Guy, is that your bugbear as well? Well, I think that, you know, that, that uh, to go back a few generations, that used to be true with uh, in the old days when people sent Christmas cards to one another. You'd get a Christmas card from someone you hadn't heard from for 10 years and their life seemed to be so wonderful. So I think that's, that, that trend has always been with us. OK, well, thank you very much, Guy, in Hong Kong and Dane here in London. Let's find out what's trending in Australia now. Let's go to our reporter, um, Phil Mercer, who is in Sydney, who's been following a certain court case, I believe, Phil. Yes, it's, um, well, it's the trial of the year. It involves uh, Australia's richest woman and uh, quite possibly the richest woman in the world. She is Gina Reinhardt. She's been accused by two of her children of uh, mishandling a multi-billion dollar family trust fund. And this family feud is extremely bitter. It's very long running. And uh, over the last week or so, it's gone to trial, a civil trial in the New South Wales Supreme Court here in Sydney. And that trial has wound up. And the judge involved in this uh, very bitter case has reserved his judgment. So still no resolution of this long running feud. Uh, when a judge reserves his judgment, uh, essentially, he goes away to think about things. And uh, what a lot of things uh, this particular judge has had to deal with both sides in this uh, very nasty affair accuse each other of uh, mishandling this particular case and uh, of course being so wealthy Gina Reinhardt and her family feud have been uh, in the headlines for the last seven days here.
been on the headlines. They've been trending on the social media networks. Absolutely. Um, court reporters inside have been giving us uh, live updates of every twist and turn too. So uh, social media in the news world is uh, an extremely important uh, weapon for news organisations who are chasing uh, listeners and, and viewers all around the country and indeed all around the world. So uh, safe to say if you look at uh, social media and type in the words Gina Reinhardt, uh, no doubt it will come out pretty top of the list, I'd say. OK, Phil, many thanks. Thanks for that update. So that's what's happening um, in Sydney, one of the main business headlines. Let's get a recap on what's happening from the main BBC newsroom now with Neil Nunes. The senior Democrat in the United States, Harry Reid, says there's been tremendous progress in negotiations about the U.S. debt crisis and government shutdown. His Republican counterpart, Mitch McConnell, said they'd had a good day, but both men acknowledged there was more work to do. The United States says a Libyan militant leader who was seized earlier this month in Tripoli by American special forces has been transferred to New York. Officials said Abu Anas al-Libi had been questioned on board a Navy ship while travelling to the U.S. and would face criminal charges. The Brazilian government says it's moving all its official communications to new software that's been developed by the country's information technology agency. The Expresso V3 software is expected to start replacing the Microsoft Outlook as the government's email server next month. It'll run exclusively on Brazil-based servers, and the authorities say its encryption will guard against foreign surveillance. To the market now, in New York, the Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 0.4% to close at 15,301, and $1 will get you 98.65 Japanese yen. Now, Iranians have seized the opportunities to mock the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, for the second time in a week after his Twitter account briefly followed a site for Iranian erotica, The link was removed a few hours later from Mr. Netanyahu's Twitter page, which is administered by his Likud party. Our Middle East analyst, Sebastian Usher, has this report. There's been considerable glee in Iranian social networks after Mr. Netanyahu's Twitter feed added to the select list of sites it follows a new one called Persian Hotbook. The site describes itself as the first library of sex books in Persian. Screenshots of Mr. Netanyahu's page were swiftly shared by Iranians, having a joke at the expense of the Israeli Prime Minister, who's continued to take the hardest of lines against Iran's leaders. The link was removed after several hours. Mr. Netanyahu's office said it was not involved in his Twitter feed. His Likud party said it had been a malfunction that was being investigated. And that report from Sebastian Usher. Neil, thanks very much. Well, Dan Cobain, uh, social media strategist, is still in the studio with me. So listening to that story uh, about uh, a Twitter account being hacked, he's certainly not the first, is he, Mr Netanyahu, to have his uh, Twitter account hacked and uh, something rather unfortunate put up instead? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of high profile cases recently with, you know, some of some of the biggest brands in the world, Um, not just on Twitter, actually, as well. There's been a lot of online activity hitting the news recently, actually. Um, But, you know, having said that, there there are there are ways that he could almost have been fooled. It would be theoretically possible if you managed to get him to follow an account that you owned, you would be able to change the username. You would, uh, you know, the, the, the at name on Twitter as well, the bio, the picture and everything. So if you could trick him into following you and then change it all round then you could you could almost do it to discredit somebody as well so it's uh you know was he hacked did he uh accidentally follow somebody was he just on a following spree and following a couple of hundred people on a time it's quite difficult to protect yourself then really it's very if you if you are becoming a target how do you protect yourself well that's the thing isn't it really i mean i I suppose just uh, keeping an eye on it making sure again you want to make sure your password's encrypted you can um you can have a double opt-in on your phone now as well to make it less likely that you know somebody can can steal your phone essentially and access your accounts um it, it, yeah there's there, there are there are things you can do but obviously with any third party, party social network and site you're never going to be fully safe so guy steer uh, from society general is in hong kong guy are these types of hacks a, a real issue making the news where you are um I think yes, it's it's a sort of similar types of stories. Most of them are um, well. The, the the one you cited from Israel does seem uh, very entertaining as a sort of, as long as somebody who's uh, who's not directly involved with it. Yeah, I think it is a it is a, something that people are concerned about. People are a lot more concerned about uh, cyber security. 
uh, in general. Um, but I think uh, one of the things is uh, one of the things that does strike me is that people are a little bit uh, l less, more and more forgiving at people's uh, online mistakes over time because they do realize that these mistakes crop up over and over again. Uh, so therefore, what was perceived maybe three or four years ago as being fairly unforgivable now seems to be uh, somewhat more run of the mill. OK, Guy, many thanks, and Dane too. Do stay with us. I've got lots more uh, stories to talk about, including this one. They've been ringing doorbells up and down the Rue and Avenue of France for half a century, but now it looks like thousands of Avon ladies, or perhaps we should call them Avon Madame, might have to pack up their cosmetic bags for good. It's emerged that the French operations of the US cosmetics giant Avon products are to be closed by the end of the month. Avon's Parisian office says only current orders will be guaranteed and it is unsure of its self-employed, whether its self-employed representatives will be able to get supplies after the end of October. So the door-to-door -door direct sales method appears to be running into a few problems in France. Dane Cobain, social media strategist, we, we see that Avon has actually gone online. It doesn't just rely on door-to-door -door strategies. But do you think the fact that this strategy maybe becoming unstuck in France could indicate that the company needs to uh, become or become even more modern, really, and move with the times? Um, well, I think there's, a, there's been a big shift in the way that marketing works, um, basically sort of since the rise of the internet, although there were, there, uh, there were hints of it before. Essentially, the old method of marketing was, was outbound marketing, where you interrupted people with television adverts, radio adverts, you know, magazine adverts, um, even knocking on their doors, ringing on their telephones. Um, whereas now, actually, it's the other way around. Uh, consumers have the power now to actually go out and find what they want online, or um, they will ask their friends. It's a lot easier to, to get these opinions from other people. Um, and, the, you know, the, 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 um, the idea of knocking on someone's door is, is part of this old sort of interruptive method of, of, um, of advertising. Um, having said that, I, I, I mean, one of the, the, the good things about the Avon ladies is actually people tend to actually build up a report and they, they, they actually build up the trust with the, the person that's coming, um, you know, door to door. And I, I'd be interested to see why in particular it's just France, whether there's, you know, whether there's any particular reason for that. I'm sure they've, you know, backed that up with... with well, Avon. so far, Avon's been pretty quiet, um, but employees have indicated that they thought the business um, wasn't going as well as was hoped, but we do know that Avon is still very, very strong. The brand is incredibly strong in places such as South Africa, uh, where business appears to be being the recruit booming. They're recruiting more and more Avon ladies. Let's have a chat to Guy Staves in Hong Kong. Guy, um, Avon also has got a big presence in Asia. Do you think the kind of door-to-door -door sales operations are still uh, very popular and, and valid in your part of the world? Well, I think that um, it's probably probably much uh, the same sort of relationship that, or reaction that people have uh, in Hong Kong as it would be in Paris. I think that if you're dealing with a product which is absolutely new that you haven't seen before, that you'd like to sort of physically test and try, uh, then um, physical shops, door-to-door uh, -door selling, um, physical shops on the high street are very valuable. But if it's something that you buy over and over and over and over again, uh, then it may be just more efficient and easier to buy it online. So, Dane, you were telling me a little bit earlier that you have a particular memory of Avon ladies because they were real stalwart of the, the British street, really going up and down, ringing doorbells, and still are. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I suppose where I grew up, they all, they were always sort of knocking on our door. Again, this is this is how I know the whole rapport thing because my, my mother actually is uh, she still buys from our Avon Avon lady. So, um, but again, how long that will last until she starts ordering online when it's cheaper, easier? You can do it sitting down. You know, you, you probably actually wait about the same amount of time for for your you know for your product to get delivered as well. Um, and I suppose if you know what you want, it's easier to just go online and get it than it is to to wait for the Avon lady to come. And the problem is, though, with something like makeup, it's a bit like clothes as well. You'd have to try it on. You well, can't just order online. 
Well, I suppose this is the thing, isn't it? That, uh, you, you know, as, as has been mentioned, if if it's a product that you 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 know you use all the time and you, you just stock up on it again every time it's ran out, then um, th- then yes, you, you know, you, you would you would be able to buy that online. But again, uh, there's a, a rising um, thing happening as well of people going into stores, um, trying products, and then checking on their smartphones to see whether it's cheaper to buy it online anywhere. I think it's, it's, it's about forty odd percent of consumers uh, with smartphones have admitted doing that. So whether the numbers higher or not is anyone's guess so something about free makeup trying elsewhere but there's no such thing as a free lunch so the old saying goes in other words you don't get something for nothing but in these dire economic times many of us giving our time and work away for free are we doing that well just think of all the interns trying to get onto the first rung of the career ladder by working for no pay. That's happening according to our regular commentator Lucy Kellaway of the Financial Times. She gets very annoyed about people who willingly work for free and she says voluntary unpaid workers are ruining it for the rest of us. About 15 years ago when Alan Clark was still alive and when he was Britain's only entertaining MP, I rang him up and asked if I could interview him. He said he'd be delighted, but I would need to pay him for his time. Oh, no, I said, all prissy and shocked. In that case, he replied, no dice. Saltwood Castle, his medieval family home in the English countryside, needed a new roof, and there was no way he was going to work for nothing. At the time, I took this as evidence of Clark's solipsism and greed. But now I've changed my mind. For him to ask for money was so reasonable there was no need for him to invoke the leaking roof. He was selling his time and his opinions and he had the same right to charge for them as someone selling soap powder. Working for nothing, it seems to me, is generally a bad thing. There are, of course, the interns who slog away for no payment. This system is exploitative, discriminates against those who don't have rich parents and is often illegal. But even so, it isn't altogether senseless from the intern's point of view. They gain experience, and doors may open. More of a mystery is the explosion in the unpaid work done by professional people with lots of experience and with satisfying day jobs, but who still insist on filling their spare time with extra work for which they're paid zilch. They blog and tweet for nothing, they talk on panels, go on conferences, give advice and even write books, all for nothing. But why? This makes sense when it's for a good cause. But then it's voluntary work and the whole point of that is that you don't get paid. Another reason is if the work is truly fascinating or is something you've always wanted to do but couldn't do otherwise. Also, it's good publicity. This is why most people work for nothing. They think it will help them sell books or build their brands or be good for networking. I can see if you get invited on Oprah, then you must go along with it. But many things people do to help sell books or sell themselves are not obviously effective at all. There's one more reason people agree to do unpaid work, because it feels good to be in demand. But this is irrational, as to value yourself at nothing should make you feel very bad indeed. If we all did an Alan Clark and refused most unpaid work, I predict it would lead to a rise in happiness-adjusted GNP. There will be far fewer pointless events, which would mean everyone could go to the pub or see their children instead. Moreover, the quality of output would rise. Money isn't perfect, but it's the best way we have of rationing effort. If you're paying someone to do something and it's no good, then you can tell them to do it better. And finally, it would mean that those old-fashioned organisations that still pay people a salary in return for labour would get better value, as people would stop spending their lives moonlighting and get on with what they were paid for. This is Lucy Kellaway for the BBC World Service. So are, as Lucy says, interns ruining it for the rest of us. It's hardly their fault, is it? Guy Steer from Société Générale in Hong (coughs) Kong. You're still with us. What do you think? Well, I think the first thing is maybe uh, your audience should be asking Dane and myself how much we're being paid or whether we're doing this for free. Because <laughs> if we're doing it for free, they should quickly turn it off. Um, but And it's always difficult to argue with uh, Lucy Kellaway, and I think her points are uh, well made. But I do think that particularly what you see is a lot of people who are uh, – a lot of interns, for example, who are not being paid. I mean – um, I've worked with paid interns, with unpaid interns. I think one thing you see is that unpaid interns generally have fewer skills to sell. 
and so they are getting more out of the experience because they can offer you less so you probably wouldn't take them as an intern if you were paying them a lot of money. But at what point should they start being paid? Is it after they've been there for a certain amount of time or is it when they're fulfilling a specific role, filling a gap in a, on a rotor system, for example? Well, I don't think they need to be filling in necessarily a gap or a specific... They don't need to be doing something specific, but I think they need... they. they um, they should be paid once they're doing something that they're bringing in a set of skills that, and doing something that really is worth uh, being paid for. And I think in that case, both the intern knows and, and we know whether the intern should be paid or not. Dane, what's your experience of being an intern? Do you think you were exploited at all? Um, well, I don't think I was exploited, actually. I mean, I had a lot of fun. I was working as a music journalist, and uh, a lot of what I learned actually set me in you know, great stead for, for, um, for, for my actual career. Uh, um, I think, I think people, people wouldn't be willing to work for nothing anyway unless they saw that they were getting something out of it, whether it's the experience, whether it's a reference. I mean, at the moment, anyway, with, with how tough it is for, you know, for, for young people to get a job anyway... Um, even just doing, you know, a, a short period of an un- unpaid internship can actually set your CV apart from everybody else's as well. So, Dane's right, isn't he? In this, at this time when um, it's really tough to get a job for many young people, doing unpaid work experience or being an intern is essential, isn't it, to to brush up the CV, guy? I think it's it's. Just- Essentially, it's it's very useful on your CV to to say I've been doing this and I've had these skills and I've been learning this. I think that's important. I think it's also important for uh, an employer to look at somebody and say, "You have you worked in an office before? Do you like working in an office? Uh, how are you going to deal with that experience?" So I think it is. It it's not just what it physically looks like on the CV, but when you do an interview with somebody, you can talk to them about their experiences and say, what did you like, what did you not like? And that's important. Very important. OK, guys, dear, many thanks for talking Thank to us much. from Hong Kong. Really great to have you on the programme. And also Dane Cobain, lots of really interesting stuff on social media. Thank you for listening to Business Matters with me, Susanna Streeter.